Gospel of Luke. On Sunday morning, we're in a sermon series looking at Jesus' encounters with women. Not just women. It could be men if you wanted to. It could be teenagers. It could be boys. It could be girls. Because the situations that the women present to Jesus are really for everyone. But we're looking at it from the perspective of the fair sex. Today's message, Jesus and the Shady Woman. And as you're turning there, there are two stories in the gospel. Four gospels, in all four gospels there are two stories. Where women come to Jesus. And they wash his feet with their tears. They dry his hair. Dry his feet with their hair, excuse me. And then they put fragrance on his feet. That they might have a pleasant smell. Now one of those stories is in Matthew. This one, as we're going to see in just a moment, is in Luke. And they're not the same story. Many people get confused and think these two stories are one and the same. They're not. They're similar, but they're entirely different stories. Matthew told his story from a different perspective because it's a different story. Luke is going to tell his story from a different perspective because he has a different purpose in it. Let's read Luke chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verse 36 through the end of the chapter, but let's read together the first four verses. Then one of the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the legalists, asked Jesus to eat with him. And Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. Now, Dr. Luke is very polite. This is a sinner. But in context, this sin is a particular sin called harlotry, prostitution. That's what she is. She's a whore. There's no other way to say it. That's what she is. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears, to wipe them with the hair of her head. She kissed his feet. She anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he spoke to himself quietly. He whispered to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. In our story, we're introduced to an unknown, basically unnamed woman who finds herself at a dinner party where Jesus has been invited. Her profession is not a nurse. She's not an elementary school teacher. She's a prostitute. She's a harlot. She makes money by selling her body to dirty old men. The men call her for her services. The women call her a tramp. The Romans call her trash. The religious leaders call her an unclean, deplorable, unloved by God, eternally doomed. But Jesus calls her a sinner who needs a Savior. And he came for such people. Let me say that again. When Jesus saw her, he saw someone who was a sinner. 
And sin comes in a lot of different names. Amen? A lot of different slants and shades. She was a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of the God, by the way. And Jesus saw her. He saw her sin. And for such he came. For such he would die. And one day we shall see such in heaven. Just like her. But before we look at the parable, because this story is a parable. I want us to understand five things about the story. So let's consider these five points real quick. This dinner party that she is about to enter into, Jesus was invited to. It's an outdoor affair. Not indoors, it's outdoors. It's underneath a pavilion. And hundreds of people have been invited to this dinner party. Political people are there. Religious people are there. Celebrity people are there. Athletes are there. Actresses are there. Actors are there. There's literally hundreds of people in attendance at this party for big shots. And Jesus has been invited. Now, listen to me carefully. If you were not invited, you could still watch what was going on. Because around this dinner party, there is a buffer of about 10 feet. And as long as you give 10 feet clearance, even if you weren't invited, even if you weren't a guest, you are permitted to stand outside the buffer of 10 feet and watch everything that is being done, hear everything that's being said, you're allowed to do that. And so this woman, she's not been invited, obviously. But she does have a right to stand outside the buffer. And her eye catches Jesus. She knows who he is, and we'll talk about that in a minute, how she does. And she's listening and she's seen how he's treated. She's seen how he, what kind of experience he's having. Secondly, it is traditional and it was customary. It was good etiquette. It was good manners in that day. When you invite people to a dinner party or you invite people anywhere for that matter. Into a place where you're in charge, you're in control. You are responsible for greeting them. We would greet people with a handshake and a hug. And that day they greeted people with a kiss. That was customary. It was traditional. There was nothing sexual about it. It was cordial. It was a friendly way of saying welcome. That was expected. You welcome people with a kiss. You do then receive a foot washing. There wasn't a lot of pavement in that day. Most of the roads, if not all of the roads, were dusty and dirty. So when you came to these functions, not only would you be welcomed with a kiss, but you'd be sat down. And there would be servants there who would wash your feet, clean your feet. And then thirdly, they would anoint your feet with a pleasant perfume, a fragrance, a, 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 a lotion, if you will. And that's what they did. That was common courtesy. Whether you were a little shot or a big shot, whether you were an unknown or a celebrity, it didn't matter. If you were invited, that's the way that you were to be treated. And not to do so was arrogance. It was, it was bad manners, improper etiquette. It would be a shame, an embarrassment to invite somebody and not... Treat them as I just told you. Thirdly, this dinner party that has hundreds of people, probably hundreds more standing outside the buffer so they can watch what's taking place and hear what's being said and somehow get an idea of how the upper crust lives. This dinner party. Hundreds are in attendance, has been hosted by a Pharisee. 
The Pharisees were one of the religious groups in Israel of that day. The other group was the Sadducees. They were like the Republicans and Democrats politically today, except they were in the religious world. The Sadducees were the liberals. They didn't believe in the Lord. They didn't believe in the Bible. I don't know what they believed. I don't know if they believed anything. A lot, a lot of preachers in churches today, I suppose. But the Sadducees were what you would call the liberals. The Pharisees were what you would call the legalists. They believed the entire Bible. They believed in God. So much so that they added over 600 plus rules to the Bible of their day and said you got to follow these. If you don't follow our rules, you won't go to heaven. Reminds me of pastors and churches today who do the same thing. And so this Pharisee is hosting the dinner party. He's a legalist. He knows all the laws of the word and he knows all the laws of the Pharisees. And he has invited Jesus. I wonder why. Because quite frankly, everything Jesus would believe in, he wouldn't. Everything Jesus is going to teach, he would not accept. You see, Simon, the name of the Pharisee, is a self-righteous man. Do you know any self-righteous people? I'll tell you how you can tell if they're self-righteous or not. They walk around patting themselves on the back. Now, if you do that long enough, you'll break your arm. But he was a self-righteous man, like most all the Pharisees. He thought he was doing God a favor when he showed up at church. He thought he was showing God how important God is in his life when he came and he served. He invited Jesus to this party, not because he was interested in who Jesus was or what Jesus believed or what Jesus was doing. He, he didn't care about any of that. He invited Jesus there, hoping that Jesus would say something or do something that the Pharisees could use against him to charge him with blasphemy, to charge him with treason, to take him to the Roman government and have him imprisoned or even executed. That's why he was there. That's why Jesus, when he came in, wasn't greeted with a kiss. That's why his feet wasn't washed. That's why he wasn't fragranced. They really didn't want him there. But they did want to get rid of him, and this was a way that they could do it. And so this woman standing outside the buffer, she sees Jesus go in. No kiss, no washed feet, no fragrance, nobody talks to him. By and large, he stands alone, he's ignored. And the only people who are even caring that he's there are the spies that are there to try to find him to say something that they can use against him or do something that they can use against him. See, you understanding where we're going with this? Number four. This woman, this harlot, this prostitute, if you will, she's been following Jesus. This is not her first encounter with him. She wouldn't have been so brazen. She wouldn't have been so bold if she hadn't seen him before or heard him before or experienced him before to approach him as she did. Apparently, she has went to places where Jesus has spoke. Maybe she's been to places where Jesus has performed miracles or acts of kindness. People like her can't go to many places. They'd be run off. The men would flirt with them and the women would call them names. But apparently she dressed herself up enough that she could go. And listen to this man called Jesus. I wonder what she heard him say that would bring her to the Pharisees' dinner party to hear him again, to see him again, maybe to experience him for her own self. 
When you follow Jesus' preaching in the Gospels, his sermons, you'll find that he talked about the same subjects, he just changed the way he presented them. I've told you many times when I was coaching football, we had about 10 plays, but we could do them 100 different ways. Well, Jesus had the ability to say the same thing over and over and over, but say it in a different way where it would catch your ear. Stick in your mind, convict your heart. So as Jesus is there, I wonder if her mind doesn't go back to this woman's. To a sermon that she heard Jesus preach about how God loves people. That's a good sermon, isn't it? God loves people. But God so loved the world, the Bible says. She heard Jesus talk about the love of God. She didn't know that kind of love. She didn't know the love of God. She didn't know the love of man. All she knew was the love of self. And she didn't even love herself when she looked at herself in the mirror. But she heard Jesus talk about God's love. God's love for everybody. Not just you over here. Not just you here. Not just you here. Not just you here. Not just this one up here. Not just that one in the back. God loves, yes, but God loves all. Red or yellow, black or white, we are equal and loved in his sight. Doesn't matter your color, your creed, your class, your culture, your countenance, your circumstance, your customs, your condition. He loves you. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. And there's nothing you can do to make him love you less. He loves you with the zenith. And she heard that. And oh, how she must have cried when she heard that. Nobody ever said that to her. I wonder if she didn't hear Jesus speak in the past about how God is a God, not only of loving people, but a God of grace and mercy toward people. Nobody offered her grace. Nobody extended her mercy. They spit at her. They threw rocks at her. They cursed at her. And yet she hears from this man called Jesus, there's a God in heaven whose grace is greater than sin, whose mercies are tender. She needed to hear that. So do they. And so do we. I wonder if she didn't hear him talk about the forgiveness of sin by this God. I don't know if she was a religious woman or not. Maybe she had been exposed to it at different times. But she's hearing things that are really touching her mind and heart. There's a God in heaven who loves, but loves her. There's a God in heaven of grace and mercy, and that grace and mercy is extended to her. There's a God in heaven who forgives, and he covers all sin with that forgiveness. She looked in the mirror, she saw a prostitute. And God forgives prostitutes. He forgives murderers. He forgives rapists. He forgives thieves and liars and cheats and abusers and drunkards and thugs and punks. He'll forgive you too. Forgives. Are you catching on why she's following Jesus? She's never heard anybody ever say that. The Sadducees just say you can't believe it. And the legalists say it doesn't apply to you. And yet Jesus doesn't say that. Then she heard him say something else. If you give your life to him. He will save you. He will change you. He'll give you a new beginning and a fresh start. He'll give you a makeover and a do-over. You don't have to stay the way you are. He will love you as you are, but he loves you so much he won't keep you as you are. 
would change it. And this shady lady is about to become a virtuous lady. She's about to meet the master. That's why she's there. She has heard Jesus speak before. She's seen what he can do. And now she sees she has an opportunity. Admittedly at a dinner party where she's not invited and certainly not welcomed. But she's going to make a break for it. I'd like, I, I've said many times, we get to heaven. I hope we get our popcorn and our big drinks. Sit back in those chairs. You know the, those chairs at the movie theater where you can lean all the way back. If the movie's no good, you can nap. <laughs> Cartoon movies, I do that sometimes. You know, the grands like them. My wife likes them. <laughs> but I wonder when we get to heaven, if we can't pull this movie up. Because I'd really like to see her outside in that buffer. And she's getting antsy. And she's saying, i got to get to him. And all of a sudden, she just makes a break for it. And goes to where Jesus is. For whatever reason, security didn't stop her. Maybe they couldn't. They didn't know she was going to do it. But she gets to Jesus. And as we're going to see in just a moment, he's going to save her soul. I like stories with happy endings. He is going to take her darkness and turn it into light because he's the light of the world. He's going to take her death and give her life because he's the life of the world. He's going to take her hell-bound status and the tickets she has on her way there. He's going to change it to a heaven-bound status. A new ticket going a new direction. He's going to change her from a harlot of Satan to a princess of a king called Jesus. He's going to take somebody old and trashy and make her new and classy. Religion can't do it. The Sadducees can't do it. The Pharisees can't do it. Philosophy can't do it. But Jesus can do it. He will save her as we shall see. Notice in verse 48, if you just glance a little further ahead, your sins are forgiven, he says to her. Your sins are forgiven. Let's look now at the parable of this. Now remember, a parable was how Jesus taught. It's a simple story that has a simple meaning. Never forget that. It's not a complex story. It's not got 68 different meanings. It's a simple story that has a simple message to those who wish to believe. Now, if you don't want to believe, you won't catch the meaning of this. You'll walk out and say, that was the stupidest story I've ever heard the pastor tell. It's because you don't care and God isn't going to give revelation to people who don't want it. But if you're here this morning and you're saying, I really want to understand what this story's about, I think I've got a grasp of it. I think I've got a grasp of it. Well, let's look and see. Beginning with verse 40. And Jesus answers and says to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon says, teacher, you may speak. Here's the parable. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they had nothing which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? This is Jesus speaking to Simon. Simon the Pharisee answers and says in verse 43, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you are rightly judged. You have rightly spoken. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, 
Now, this woman who was outside, remember, the buffer, she's broke through the buffer. She's now at the feet of Jesus. She's kissing his feet. She's, she's using her tears to wash his feet. She's going to dry his feet with her hair. She's going to take out an alabaster box of, of some type of ointment, probably right uh, expensive ointment. She's going to rub them on his feet. And while she, she's doing all of this, and Simon's thinking his ugly thoughts about her, Jesus is now telling the story. So there's a lot going on here, okay? But notice what Jesus says to the woman in verse, says concerning the woman to Simon in verse 44. Do you see this woman? I entered your house, Simon. You gave me no water for my feet. But she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped my feet with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil. But this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Look at verse 47. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, Simon, and he's talking to Simon, and maybe he's pointing at him. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Jesus turns to the woman and says, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with Jesus began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, Jesus speaking to her again, your love has saved you. Good. You're smarter than you look today. Just kidding. You're a handsome, pretty group. Notice what it says. You're always saved by what? Faith. Doesn't hurt to love the Lord, but you're saved by faith. She wasn't saved by her love. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Simple story, simple meeting. The greater you have been forgiven by the Lord, the more you'll love Him. The greater you have been forgiven of your past by the Lord, the greater you will love Him. And this woman had great sin. She received great forgiveness. And she loved the one who gave her that greatly. That's why she kissed his feet. That's why she washed his feet. She had lotioned his feet. That's why she left forgiven. What about Simon? He didn't do nothing. No kiss for Jesus. No washing his feet. No drying his feet. No fragrance in his feet. Didn't even want Jesus to be there. Why? Because he had no love for Jesus. Because he never saw himself as a sinner who needed forgiven. I do not need Jesus. Why should I love him? I do not want Jesus. Why should I love him? I do not care for Jesus. Why? Should I love him? Remember Simon the Pharisee? Lord, you're lucky to have me in the kingdom. Miles Road Baptist Church, you're lucky to have me. Are we? To those who have been forgiven little, they love little. 
To those who have been forgiven much, they love much. And I'll take one person who has been forgiven greatly and loves Jesus greatly than a 99 of the other kind. And that's the problem. She saw herself for what she was. And Simon never did. She's in heaven. He's not. He never saw he was a sinner. You know, we got folks like that as I close right now. They hear Bible preaching, gospel preaching. And they say, he's not talking to me. I've never lied. I've never cheated. I've never stolen. I've never slept around. I don't lie. I don't cheat. I don't step on people's feet. I don't cuss and fuss and boogie all night long. I didn't do I haven't done anything. I don't really need a savior. That was Simon's attitude. And if that's your attitude, you will meet Simon one day in the place called hell. Hell is full of people who didn't need a savior. Heaven is full of people who did. And they reached out to Jesus and he reached out to them. I wonder who loves Jesus the most. A poor man who trust is in him to provide for his basic needs every day? Or the rich man who has the big house and the three cars and the gold and the silver? I wonder who really loves Jesus the most. Who loves Jesus the most, the wicked man or the self-righteous man? The low-class tramp or the high-class big shot? Who loves Jesus the most? The one who's been imprisoned? Or the one who's been pardoned, excused, never caught? A wheeler dealer who gets out of everything. I wonder who loves Jesus more? The sick who have had to depend on him for healing? Or those who are always healthy and don't need anybody? A doctor of any kind. I wonder who loves Jesus more, someone who's grew up in a home where they were abused and battered and molested, or somebody who grew up in a home with a silver spoon in their mouth. The ones who love Jesus the most have experienced him the greatest. And such shall be the kingdom of God. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.